There we go. Okay. Now it's connecting. And oh, yeah. And we're live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, my students. Welcome to Featured English Teacher. I'm Ellie, and today we're, we're going to be talking to an uh, English teacher, Brad. Hi, Brad. Hello, or uh, Dobri Den, as we say over here. <laughs> ah, <laughs> where is over there? Over there would be Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic. <laughs> and how long have you been living in Prague? Um, it's going to be nine years uh, in August. Wow, okay. So you must love it there. Oh, yeah, I'm, I, it's great. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel a great connection to the city. I mean, the only other city I probably feel that kind of connection to would be New York, but uh, Prague has been a lot nicer to me, let's say that. Okay, good, good. And, and you say that you say that you feel more like a New Yorker. Um, what do you like about New York? What I like about New York is how you can come from another place and reinvent yourself there and see who you really are. And I wanted to move to New York all my life. I'm originally from Southern Maine, but I always wanted to live there. And I finally did uh, during most of my 20s. And I reinvented myself so much I didn't need to be in New York anymore. Uh, but I, I still have quite a bit of fondness for the city. And what brought you to Prague? How did you end up in Prague? Uh, chance, really. Uh, so as I said, I, I was living in New York and um, I wasn't really happy with how things were going. And then my boss, who, uh, Zach, who's a very good friend of mine, he said to me one day, I think you're done with New York. And I thought, well, that's crazy. And I decided I'm going to show he was wrong. And he was right. And I told him, I think you're right. He said, all right, go to Europe. Like, well, I can't afford to. He said, no, no, no. Move to Europe. See it that way. You keep saying you want to see Europe. Go see it. So I needed a job uh, where I could say where I wanted to go. And because of my educational background, I thought about uh, the American foreign ministry, but they tell you where to go. And they usually tell you to go to a bad place in your first five years. So I would be like, oh, I want to go to Europe. And they'll be like, that's nice. Enjoy Afghanistan. So, mm. uh, so, okay, I could teach English. How do I do that? I need to be certified. How do I do that? Okay, I go to a school. So I emailed a couple of schools in, in Europe, and one was in Prague, and they were very personal with me. They said, how can we help you today? What do, we, what do you need? And I told them, this is my background. This is why I'm thinking about doing this. And they said, Prague is calling to you. Okay. <laughs> so we had some discussions, and um, I decided to give it a try. Um, it, it could have been Berlin, it could have been Bilbao, it could have been Budapest, but it turned out to be Prague. Okay, wow. And now, how long have you been an English teacher? Uh, I have been an English teacher since the fall of 2014. Okay, okay. So tell us a little bit about what type of classes you've taught within this from since 2014. Mostly it's conversational and uh, general English, but uh, I've worked with a wide range of people from NATO officers to immigrants to uh, political officials. It's been quite interesting seeing the wide range of um, perspectives that you get with English students and also the geographic range too. I've worked with someone from every continent at this point. And, and what about uh, teaching in schools in Prague? Have you taught in any schools in Prague? Um, when I first started, 
I did work with a language school for about two years, uh, but uh, I felt that I could be more in line with both what I like about teaching and what the students need if I were independent. So uh, in the summer of 2016, I switched to being self-employed and I've been that way ever since. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what the classes were like in the school first. Well, it, it depended on the uh, what the what the business wanted. So it could have been business English, it could have been uh, group English, it could have been uh, an individual who just wanted to practice their English. So. That was kind of the interesting thing is I didn't know what I would get. So I could do uh, a business English lesson and, you know, the students like, no, we want to follow the book very strictly. And then I would go halfway across town and there would be a guy who just wanted me to watch the game with him and just talk to him in English while we were watching it. And it was so it was it was uh, it was interesting. It really depended on uh, the client and sometimes the individual student. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned group classes. Uh, what were those like? Uh, again, it, it varied. Some could be very interesting because you see the different perspectives. And then some could be difficult because you had people at different levels or different levels of engagement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so okay. it, again, it, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying it, it would depend on those on those uh, elements. So I remember one class in particular where I had someone uh, who could barely speak English, someone whose English was okay and someone who studied English at the master's level in university. So sometimes it could be a challenge. Mm -hmm. How many uh, students were in a group class? Again, it varied. Um, usually it was three to five, but I remember one as big as eight. Okay, okay. And were these um, high school students or adults? Overwhelmingly adults. Um, I never worked with children in a in a group capacity, so these were usually um, business professionals in their twenties and thirties. And and you are now working for yourself. Tell us a little yes. bit about your classes and your students. Well, I uh, as I said, I have a wide range of people, both geographically and in terms of business. So right now I have engineers, NATO officials, um, uh, people from Israel, people from Brazil, people from Poland. So you're getting a very wide range of uh, both uh, cultures and backgrounds. And that's what makes it really interesting, both as a teacher and as a person because you're seeing different parts of the world from a different perspective where you'll only see it in the news media or uh, what other people think. And I think that's part of the reason why I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. and, and do you teach primarily conversation classes or is it business? What sort of classes do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Primarily, it is uh, conversation in general English, um, and there's a wide range of that. I, I have people who want to go through the book, and then I have people who are just like, no, talk to me for an hour and correct me. So, you know, it, 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 it's a wide range, and I try to do what the uh, student wants as best as possible. Mm -hmm. Have you had any things that were difficult between you and the student like for example i have a sometimes have a hard time with trying to explain something if, if it's a if it's a basic student it's difficult sometimes to explain a, a word or mostly uh, like idioms or sarcasm especially oh, yes. especially in china sarcasm for me was the hardest to explain 
and they take things so literally that it's hard to say, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're kidding? So uh, have you had anything like that with these different cultures? <laughs> um, well, no, 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 I, uh, it, it's, I think the difficult thing for me when I first moved to the Czech Republic was how uh, deadpan uh, Czechs can be. Um, and uh, actually, one story that my students love is um, when I lived in New York City, I was a tour guide. I I'm going somewhere with this. And um, I would always say, hi, how are you? Uh, what are you? Where are you from? You know, before the tour started. And one, one time when I was at, I think, Rockefeller Center, the, I had this man who just went, I am from Prague. It is in the Czech Republic. I, oh, oh, okay. So I'm doing all of my, you know, dumb jokes and my clever stories and <laughs> right in front of me, occasionally. Then he came up to me at the end of the tour. He gave me a huge tip and he said, thank you. This is the best tour I've ever had. And then he left. And I remember thinking, wow, Czechs are very weird. I don't think I'd live in that place. <laughs> Life is funny sometimes. Um, so when I first got here, it was that same kind of thing. And, and, and I thought maybe people don't like me or maybe, you know, there's some kind of cultural division. No, um, Czechs are very warm and welcoming once they get to know you. Mm -hmm. And it's something I really like. Uh, some of them have even invited me to their house for Christmas, which means you are considered family. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real sense of like found community with my student body, which I really appreciate. And speaking of family, I understand your mom is listening or watching the, <laughs> this live stream. So if you want to give her a quick shout out. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> but uh, I totally, she, she, yes. I was just going to say, you know, uh, we, we call every, uh, every weekend. And, uh, yep. And she's, uh, she's a good mom. She's, she's very uh, appreciative of my situation. And she lets me talk about um, what I need. And uh, also a friend of mine just said he's watching, a friend from Ireland. So uh, hi, Axe, you seeing this? Um, sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, my mother. Um, you know, so she'll <laughs> let me talk about what I'm doing here or you know what excited me or upset me about a tv show and, it, and it's something i really appreciate <laughs> that's great <laughs> now, now going back to family um when i lived in prague my landlord and, and the family invited me to dinner and um, especially around the holidays because they didn't want me to be alone on the holidays which i thought was very sweet and i met um, an older lady and we got to talking about all of the tours that they have in Prague. And one of the tours that came up in discussion uh, was the ghost tour. Mm -hmm. Now this woman was in her nineties and she said to me, ghost tour. Well, we didn't have any ghosts until the tourists came. <laughs> <laughs> it just cracked me up the way she said it. She was so like, ghost. Yes. not in Prague. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not until the tourists came. That was so funny. So I, I love their sense of humor, their their directness, and me and too. They are very warm and and. Mm -hmm. it, it it takes a bit to you know to get to get to know them, but uh, when they do, it's very it's very charming. Uh, because like for example, my background is in history, mm -hmm. and uh, the thing that got me interested in history was the story of the Titanic, before Cameron's movie. I like to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> and when students, you know, see it or they or, you know, they're like, oh, Brad, Titanic, I thought of you because uh, in, in Czech, it's pronounced Titanic. Right. So, you know, it, it's nice um, when they think of me like that. And also when they go to uh, New York, they want me to help plan their trip. Oh. And yep. Yep. So they're like, you know, I want to see the best. And I'm like, OK. And. I mean, I haven't been there for, you know, um, eight or nine years, but I mean, the Empire State Building is still there. Central Park is still there. 
And of course, my favorite thing of all in New York, the Statue of Liberty, she's still there. So it's, it's fine. Have you been up the Statue of Liberty? I have um, once as a visitor and once as a, as a person who worked there. Um, I was a park ranger and that was my first job in New York. And when I went there, it was uh, the crown was still closed uh, because of um, September 11th. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big question everyone wanted to ask me was, you know, are they going to reopen it? And I said, I don't know. And he said, have you ever been up there? And I'd always go, and that would be my answer. Uh, <laughs> Officially, no. Unofficially, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty much. You know, let's let's just say that as a worker, uh, I went to a place that tourists normally don't go at all the historic sites that I worked at. I'll say that. Mm. I bet that was awesome. It was. I mean, uh, you get to see, you know, places at the Statue of Liberty or Rockefeller Center or the intrepid that normally aren't open to visitors. And uh, it's, it's neat. I'm sure. I'm sure. I've not been to New York. That's one place I've not been to. That oh, shame, love shame, to go. LA, I shame, know, shame. I know. <laughs> uh, I went to the, uh, I went to the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago. That was mm -hmm. a of mine. And, you know, pictures, absolutely. Pictures do not do this place justice or video even. It just, yeah. It's just so amazing. And I hope one day to go to New York. So, Unfortunately, I haven't been to the Grand Canyon yet, but um, <laughs> you know, the, what you just said about uh, the Grand Canyon, I, I feel that with New York. I mean, just looking at the skyline with your own eyes, it's something that, um, you know, the picture can't do. Right, right. And what other places have you been to? Uh, I've been to a lot of places in Europe, um, so I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but I've been to Vienna, Berlin, Munich, Nuremberg, Dresden, uh, Budapest, Krakow, Amsterdam, Rome, Venice. Um, I've been to the British Isles, but I was very small, so I don't remember it. Um, before the pandemic, uh, traveling was a hobby of mine, um, and I'm hoping to get back into that soon. Mine too. I mine too. Yep. I, I need to visit Stockholm. Oh, well, you're always welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, as I said earlier, um, uh, you know, uh, my, my big thing with history was the Titanic. So I know you got the Vasa. Mm -hmm. So I have to get up there at some point. You should. <laughs> it's amazing. I've heard, yeah. <laughs> um, what about languages? What, what other languages can you speak? So uh, I am learning Czech because I, I live here and, and I need it. Uh, I am also self-teaching myself German just for the heck of it with uh, apps and, and things like that. Uh, I do have a Czech teacher. Her name is Lutzi, and uh, she, she, uh, she takes my dark humor very well. I appreciate her. <laughs> Tell us about being a student learning a language. How is that similar to your students learning English? So I can tell you about an experience that I had um, the first day that I started my certification for um, being an English teacher. So we're in the classroom, we're waiting, and then this guy comes in and he's speaking Czech. And I'm like, like everybody else. And um, it was, interesting because like I still understood what he wanted because he, he used a lot of you know gestures so he's like okay paper pen showed his name ah oh, okay Brad ah oh, okay um and I remember my parents had the same question like how are you going to teach this to people who don't know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so I decided to demonstrate with them because I was just speaking gibberish but I did the same thing show you know I wrote my name and they figured out, oh, okay. And they wrote Joyce and Paul. I was like, yeah, exactly. This is, this is what we'll do. So uh, a lot of the people seem to just think, oh, okay, yeah, I don't need this. But I understood like, oh, wow, yeah. So there's going to be a real language barrier, but there is a way to get around it because you, you can act with your hands, you can show what you want. But it also got me to understand that 
it can be difficult. And so I try to keep that experience in mind uh, nine years later. Uh, although it was quite funny because um, uh, the second Czech lesson we had, uh, he held up a like a like a little sausage roll. Um, it's not really a perfect translation, but it'd be like a rolik in Czech. And he's like, Soyeto, Soyeto, what is it? And I go, Red, Nene, Rolik, Rolik. So, yeah, I, I have had that experience from both sides, and it could be quite fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had similar experiences when I lived in China. I didn't speak mm -hmm. any Chinese apart from thank you and hello. <laughs> You still got more than me. That was about it. <laughs> so I, I, I think full immersion works best in learning a language. What's your opinion? Uh, I would agree, but it could also be uh, a bit stressful because mm -hmm. I think one thing is the student kind of expects that after a few lessons, they're going to speak like uh, Oscar Wilde. And I have to constantly, you know, point out, you know, you know, like when when I go to McDonald's here, I don't go felicitations. I am endeavoring to consume a comestible. I go Big Mac, please. <laughs> so uh, they have to, you know, take it easy on themselves a little bit. And that is one thing that I always try to point out is that yes, I do a lot of correction. I do a lot of uh, pointing out when there's a mistake, but if they say to me, I go to store, I want cheeseburger, I understand them completely. That, that, that's the main point. So I think full immersion can work, but you have to be both patient and uh, motivating. So you have to be as much a morale coach as a teacher. Uh, but uh, the way I do my lessons, yes, uh, I only speak English. Mostly because I don't know what it is in Czech. So, <laughs> but if, if they're really stuck, I will go, uh, you know, umieni. Oh, art, you know, but uh, no, I, I usually do full immersion myself. And uh, what is a piece of advice that you have for your students when they're learning a language? Basically, uh, do what you can to understand the language um, outside of our time together. Because yes, it's nice that you're, you're attending the lessons. It's nice that you are learning these things, but you, you need to do more. So like watch Netflix, read a newspaper, uh, watch Euronews. It's kind of like CNN, but for Europe over here. Uh, listen to podcasts, do whatever... Um, you, you, you need to do to, to just constantly have yourself exposed to the language. And what is interesting is um, how people choose to do that, because the big thing that's popular over here is friends. And they're like, oh, Brad, you are from New York. So you, it is true, right? I'm like, no, there's no way those people are going to live in Greenwich Village, yeah, in the village, on, what on that kind doing. of salary, right? No. Exactly. <laughs> they're not getting like, like, oh, Brad, did you live in Village? I was like, no, I lived in Harlem, and part of the reason I don't live there anymore is it got too expensive. <laughs> um, but you know, and it and it is interesting to watch um, my students, um, you know, watch things and 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 see things because not only do they want to discuss it, they want to like see what I think of it. So uh, a few years ago, there was the film Don't Look Up. And I remember seeing the trailer. I thought, oh, it looks interesting. I'll see it later. And then I come back from my break and everyone's like, Brad, I saw it. I want to discuss it with you. I'm like, oh, OK. Uh, so I had to watch it that weekend. And then I was like, oh, OK, I can discuss it now. So um, it's, uh, it, it is interesting because you see how much the student is willing to expose themselves to English, but I'm also exposed to new things and new ideas as well. Mm -hmm. Do you do what I call a hard correction or a soft correction when students make mistakes? Like, do you correct um, every little thing or do you kind of go with the flow and only correct things that are really important? 
as we would say here, Zalaji, it depends. <laughs> um, if overall it is, you know, they're really producing English and they're, they're doing well, but they just dropped an article or they mispronounced a word, I'll let it go. But if it's like something that would really impact understanding, I'll probably stop them. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one thing they, that my students like is how much correcting I do. So I always give my students um, emails after every lesson. I take notes for them. So any words they missed, any new words, any collocations, idioms, like I might mention a book or oh, I saw this news article, I'll link it there. And I'll include audio of me saying and uh, pronouncing the words for them. And a lot of them have said that that is what they like most about it. And they really appreciate getting those kinds of notes after every meeting. Mm -hmm. I do something similar in mm -hmm. that part of the reasons I, the, part of the reason I started YouTube was so that I could give videos to my students say, okay, here's the, <laughs> here's the grammar point and, and do it in a fun way. I, I don't like a whiteboard. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, I, I never really did. Um, and, and it's, it's interesting because before, um, <laughs> Before the pandemic, most of my lessons were face to face, and now most of them are are online. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing, like where I, you know, point out that my students and I have a very good relationship that I appreciate because uh, when the lockdown started in the Czech Republic, I emailed everyone. I said, "What would you like to do?" And three quarters of them said, "I'd like to wait until you know the the lockdown ends because like." everyone on the planet, we thought, oh, it'll just be a week. It'll be fine. And then, and then I, I emailed them all again. And I said, look, I understand you prefer face to face, but I need money. I need to work. Can we please go online? And they all said yes. And uh, I appreciate that because, you know, my biggest worries during the pandemic were what video game am I going to download or what book am I going to get on Kindle, you know, because, because of that loyalty. And, and I really appreciate that. And um, I think it's that reliability both ways that are why I have so many students like five, six, seven years on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, now, you mentioned the going and doing online classes. Are you still doing online classes or or have you gone back to face to face? Um, some I have no choice in the matter because, as I said, I see people in uh, Israel and Brazil, so I kind of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, with people in Prague, um, it's it, I, I officially have gone back to face to face. That's fine. But the uh, most of them say, you know what, it's more convenient to go online. Uh, I, I do have uh, one or two people who said, no, I want to go back to face to face, but. Um, they all come to me, so it's no problem. Oh, that's nice. Which is the nice thing is like I'm able. I now have more time for hobbies and also more lessons because everything's online. I don't have to go from one end of Prague to the other all day like I used to. So. And and your students are all adults, right? You don't have any children. Uh, I have a couple teenagers. Okay, so you you would teach. You would teach teenagers. Yep. <laughs> kind of came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, oddly enough, most of my students are children. <laughs> ah. I started uh, I mean, with adults and then somehow it progressed into teaching children. And I, I don't know how that happened, but it just did. <laughs> uh, no, for me, it's, uh, it's just... Um, I, I prefer that the person comes and, and wants to learn, um, you know, but, but if they're happy and their parents are happy and, and I'm okay with it, then it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, grammar book or no grammar book, which do you prefer? Uh, I technically neither because I do use a, a website. Uh, it's called off to class.com and it, has a lot of great lessons already pre-made and I can share the screen. I can uh, 
send homework if they're registered and it saves me a lot of trouble and time. But uh, if the student wants to use a book, uh, actually off number two class.com. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there are also resources I use online like perfect, perfectenglishgrammar.com. I don't remember the link though, um, but uh, if you Google perfectenglishgrammar.com, it's the first hit. Uh, but if a teacher or the person organizing the lesson says, you know, I want you to use this book, I have no problem with it. But usually the student um, wants to be more organic they see me as their opportunity to practice english and so if, if if it produces more natural english to talk to them about something then i'll do that i mean you know i've had conversations about everything from movies to current events to uh you know how they don't like uh, a work of fiction that I've never seen or read before. So it's, if, if, if it produces natural English, I don't like stopping them. I have a student who's 13 and hates movies. So we mm. can't discuss movies. He, he won't watch one. He doesn't like them. <laughs> so so it, it, conversation is primarily about music or about his schoolwork. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I have people who like to talk about like movies. They like to talk about video games. They like to talk about um, what's happened this week in the world. So you get a wide range of things. And, you know, it can be interesting because uh, sometimes the teacher gets a little mixed up with the consumer in my case. And they start giving my opinion on these same video games or movies. And I, I can be quite passionate. I can say, Oh yeah, it's greater. Oh, it's terrible. And it's, <laughs> You know, it, it, uh, it's, it's uh, fun. Speaking of fun things, uh, tell, tell our viewers about your hobby. Sure. Um, so I have a couple of different hobbies. Uh, I like to write. Uh, mostly it is what's called fan fiction, where I take other people's characters and have them do something else or my own story with it. Uh, but I have... Three ebooks published, uh, short ebooks about historical topics. I like to read primarily history and science fiction. Uh, I like to build models. I like to cook, uh, but I also like to uh, do Lego, which is uh, quite fun. Uh, it's actually become a joke of my students because I have a tiny studio flat in Prague, and yet I have like twenty to thirty Lego sets here. <laughs> Like you can see some right behind me, the uh, Mario block and the, and the TV and Darth Vader's head. That was a gift from a student. And there is the pride and joy of the collection. Yes, that's my favorite. <laughs> yes. So let's also, uh, you can also see New York City there as a foam oh, puzzle. Oh my goodness. Uh, it, but yeah, the Titanic is the uh, second largest Lego set uh in the world in terms of like physical object. Uh, the world's largest is the Lego map, which I also have, you just can't see it, it's, it's over there. Um, and I am dreading that Lego is going to do like a 10,000 piece Empire State Building or something <laughs> from New York. Cause it's like, of course I'm gonna have to get that. But um, it's a common question with my students. You know, Brad, did you get new Lego? And I'm like, no. <laughs> or Brad, you must get new place. You have too much Lego. Yeah, I know. So like I'm actually um, taking a break this week and I guarantee you at least one student will be like, Brad, did you get new Lego? So. <laughs> I think that's my favorite though. That's my- The my Titanic favorite. definitely, because um, as I said, that's how I first got into history. And so the, the story of the Titanic is a special uh, spot for me. And uh, last week was actually the anniversary of the disaster mm -hmm. 111 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Carpathia is on her way to New York right now, actually. Uh, she'll be there tonight. But um, when when uh, that came out, Brad, were, my students were like, Brad, will you get Titanic? I'm like, well, I'll have to see how it looks and hear what it is. And <laughs> when, when, you know, the way the Lego designed it, it's like, oh, you know, this is what I would say. So like, you know, really big, 
lots of pieces, a partial interior. And Lego is just like, do you want to stand too? In other words, yeah, we already have all that. So I, I had to get it. And, it, it, it. and my students were quite delighted when I showed them the box. They're like, oh, Titanic is here. I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> and what was funny was uh, I like to do my Lego on the weekends because I just sit down and do it. I put on you know, YouTube or music or something. And that Friday, I had only one person in the morning. And he's one of my longest students, good guy. And I said to him, you do realize you are now the only person keeping me from opening this box, right? He's like, yes. I said, but you didn't cancel. He's like, no. I'm like, yeah. So like, like I said, uh, the Czech sense of humor is uh, quite fun. Now you mentioned that you have three eBooks. Can people purchase them? And if so, where? Yes, um, you can get them on Amazon uh, from the uh, uh, Sergeant Frosty Press. Oh. Uh, it is run by a friend of mine named David Flynn. And um, he uh, approached me for writing these books because he knew that my background was history and that I um, was a bit of a cat. Um, I hesitate to say expert on the Titanic because there are people who know far more than me, but he knew that I knew the story. So two of them are about the Titanic. One is an analysis of why the disaster happened. The second is a, um, is a, um, like a tour guide of the ship as if it were still existing. So it was really interesting to write about the Titanic in the present tense. Uh, like a tour guide, right? You know, the grand staircase is, the Titanic is. It was, it was, it was an interesting challenge. And the uh, third book was a history of the Statue of Liberty uh, because she is quite special to me. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's because of my grandmother. She gave me a, uh, a book way back when I was five or six about the Statue of Liberty. And that is why I wanted to go to New York, and that is why the place is so special to me. And in fact, let me just see here if I can switch the camera. So it's a little hard to see, but that is the poster from that book. Wow. So it went with me to New York, and it's here now, and the book is to my side. I brought both of them with me. Let me switch my camera back. So, so yeah, my... Um, my grandmother is uh, the reason why New York became such a big thing for me. Ah, I see. I see. Well, we're going to post that information in the description box below and sure. on my website at EnglishFunZone.com. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in reading any of those books, you can find it in the description box. Or and I would encourage everyone to buy the other books at uh, Sergeant Frosty Press, if I may, because there's a wide range of of stuff from uh, fantasy novels to understanding the apocalypse. So you can get a wide range of topics. And as I said, David Flynn, uh, the publisher, he's a, he's a good friend of mine. And um, you know, I appreciate that he reached out to me to have me write those books for him. It was quite fun. That's great. Now you have a website too, don't you? I do. Uh, bradandprog.cz. Okay. And is there a link for those um, books there as well? Uh, there is not because I, I keep the English teacher separate from, the, um, from that. But if you Google my name, Brad Roos, uh, you should see me in Amazon. Great. Well, I'll be posting the links and everything in the, descri in the description box below. Of course. Well, it's time to ask the questions. Uh-oh. There are 10 questions I like to ask. Sure. I like to ask teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is, what's your favorite word in English? <laughs> uh, probably imbecile. Imbecile. Oh, that's a great word. <laughs> because it's just a very fun way of, um, of uh, saying someone's an idiot. All right. And it also uh, goes to my uh, colorful sense of humor because um, uh, I was very close to my father, uh, who unfortunately has passed. And I, I remember one Christmas, there was something that I really wanted. And I said to him, Dad, this is the only thing I want, but you cannot get it in the store. You need to go to this website. I am giving you the website. Here is the website. You understand? He's like, yes. 
He went to the store. He didn't find it. And he got me something that I had no interest in. And I was like, you imbecile. (laughs) And but to his credit, when he figured out that he had messed up, he went to that website. He had express ordered. And I had it in New York a couple of days later. But because of that, uh, if there was something I needed, (laughs) I would write to him and say, imbecile, get this done. (laughs) And he'd be like, yes, sir. You know, so it was uh, just something that um, we did. Um, again, I have a, I had a lot of love and respect for him. And, you know, he just, he just, you would just went with it. <laughs> what's your, what's your least favorite word? Excuse me. What's your least favorite word in English? Negative. Negative. Uh, because uh, when, when I had, issues or difficulties sometimes people would just say oh you're being negative and mm. it was be very dismissive and so i just don't like the word um i don't like being called that and i don't like calling other people that good enough what makes you happy <laughs> lego <laughs> as as is obvious um also uh, a good book some good music uh, a good video game i do play video games i have the uh, PS4 and the Switch. Um, So my hobbies. Also cooking. I've, I've, sorry? Go ahead, sorry. I said I've started cooking as a hobby. And uh, uh, because I've always found them entertaining, I have this bad habit of impersonating Gordon Ramsay as I'm doing the recipe. Like, you know, (laughs) beautiful, yes, in. And it's it's nice to sit down and be like, yes, I made the shepherd's pie. So it's, uh, it's, it's a fun experience. Oh, well, now I have two questions. Have you ever played Psychonauts? Uh, I have not, but I know of the game. Uh, usually I play more like what are called open world games. So like uh, Assassin's Creed um, and uh, Infamous. That was a good series. Um, Riven? Riven? Riven, yeah, I played that. Um, I played that. Also... I like to play Mario games. Um, oh. The uh, that's why I have the Switch, and oh, okay. I am hoping to see the Mario movie this week. Oh. Uh, I, I I don't care that I'm 38 years old. I like Mario. <laughs> uh, you know, he's fun. Wah, woohoo! <laughs> um, and uh, also, what are called RTS games, I enjoy those. Um, probably one of my favorite games is World in Conflict, which is an alternate history where the Cold War goes hot, and it's wow. very story driven and character driven which is what i really want to see in fiction mm-hmm. well my other question now is about cooking what's your okay. favorite thing to make when you're cooking italian italian yeah in, in fact uh <laughs> i probably eat way too much pasta but it's it's too good too good it's too tasty yes <laughs> well, uh so when i cook i i like to pretend i'm julia child <laughs> 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 yes <laughs> Yes, Today no. Uh, we're going to make chicken. <laughs> that's like what I do. Yeah, like I said, that's how I am with uh, Gordon Ramsay. You know, beautiful, good, okay. Uh, unlike him, I have yet to destroy a kitchen in my rage. So that oh. that's good. I usually just go, oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is, uh, what makes you angry? Probably hypocrisy. You know, when someone says, do this or don't do this, and then they do it it's it's very irritating and do as uh, i say not as i do exactly and and it uh it gets me very angry probably a little too much but yeah that's that's what it is <laughs> and what's your favorite onomatopoeia probably boom boom yes uh so when i was a kid uh i used to watch a lot of looney tunes and um, that was a big part of my childhood, cartoons. And again, I am 38 years old and I still watch cartoons. I don't care. Um, and also um, my father, who was a huge influence on me, introduced me to Monty Python. And a lot of those scenes end with just stuff blowing up for no reason. So I, I think that just, just boom is just kind of stuck in my head because of that. Let me see. What's your favorite Looney Tune cartoon? Uh, probably the one where, where, um, Daffy Duck and Elmer Fudd are working at a hotel. I forget (laughs) the name, but there's this one guy, he's like really tired and he just wants to sleep and he keeps beating 
the, the tar out of Elmer Fudd to pop goes the weasel. <laughs> and it, and you know, it's, it's just a right in the face, very exaggerated cartoon. And, you know, he's trying not to get punched, but he always gets punched and it's, it's quite fun. That's probably my favorite. Aggressive. <laughs> but no, it's, well, it's Elmer fun, you know I mean? Yeah, but yeah. it, it, the, the whole, that's the joke is that the poor guy isn't doing anything. It's all daffy and he just keeps getting punched in the face. <laughs> Oh, what's your <laughs> what's your favorite minced oath? So it's one that's very very original. It's uh, from my grandmother. Oh. Um, so I am the oldest of my generation in the family. I have my there's my sister and my cousins, and um, I couldn't say Graham, so I said Bram, and and that's how the name stuck. It was Bram and Bramps, not Graham and Gramps. We all called them that, and. Um, when I was doing something wrong or something was about to happen, my grandmother would go dip, 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 and try to grab me. And so like that for me, has just always stuck with me. So, you know, instead of cursing or swearing, she just go dip, 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 and grab me. And, and that's always stuck. <laughs> so that's your favorite. Dip, 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 dip. Yeah, exactly. And she's the only one who's ever done it, but just that that's what I remember her doing, you know, dip, 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 like grabbing it or, or stopping it or whatever. <laughs> That'd be funny if you were really angry and you had to say that instead of swearing. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm Sorry. from New York. <laughs> I, I'm from New York. I use certain words as a comma. Let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> um, what profession, other than being a teacher, would you like to do? Probably something in history. Um, that was originally what I wanted to do, is I wanted to do something, what's called public history, where you engage um, the general public with history and you know you show them how history works why it's important why it's relevant uh but it, it didn't really quite catch on uh because new york was so competitive um i did have some great experiences with people from around the world talking about some of the greatest things in new york city so you know it wasn't a total loss but you know unfortunately it just never quite worked out and um I will say I am very much a believer that it is not history, it is how it was taught. Because one of my younger students here, um, she said, oh, I don't like history, it's boring, it's stupid. And we had a question, I forget what it was, but, and I said, it's because of this. And we talked about everything in that hour. We didn't even do the lesson plan. We talked about everything from the Black Death to the Cuban Missile Crisis to the Cold War. We just went all over history and I said, Yana, do you know what we just did? What? We just talked about history the entire hour and you were driving it. And she was like, and I said, it's how it's taught, not the subject. You have a nice day. <laughs> Thanks for playing. <laughs> Thanks for playing. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them what they won, Johnny. Right. What profession would you not like to attempt? Probably anything high stress. Um, because I, I don't like stressful situations. Um, for one thing, like people think that I would like to take a submarine down to the wreck of the Titanic because I, I like the story so much. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> because I would be in a very small place with people and, you know, the water pressure is strong enough to crush a, a cup the mm -hmm. size of a thimble. And, uh, I also remember... <laughs> I remember my father um, because uh, he grew up uh, in the 60s when there were a couple of tragic submarine accidents in the U.S. Navy, the Thresher and the Scorpion. And I think that's why he just hated the idea of submarines, because every time we watch something together, whether it was Das Boot or, you know, something where it's just a documentary and we know the submarine is going to be fine. He would say, you could never give me all that thing. And what's ironic is I actually did get him on a submarine once. Really? So How did you the, do that? Yeah. So the Growler is a Cold War era submarine that's on display in uh, New York City. It's mm -hmm. uh, tied up as part of the Intrepid Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, and when dad visited me to do some work in New York, because sometimes the office would send him, you know, we need you to go somewhere and you'd say, well, can I go to New York? Cause that's where my son is. And they go, yeah, sure. 
And so we spent one whole day going all over the, the museum and I took him on the submarine and, uh, you know, he was fine with it. But before he went on, he said, it doesn't go under, right? It just stays on the surface. And like, of course, dad, do you see the big openings here? And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I did, despite his words, I did get him on that thing. And it was, and it was for free because, you know, I got him in for free that day. <laughs> oh, that's great. So did he end up enjoying that? Experience? He did. Yes. He did. Uh, my father. Um, so we, we did that. We went all over the museum and then we went to an artifact exhibit for the Titanic, which just happened to be there that day. And then we saw the musical Avenue Q. And at the end, he texted me and he said, I had a great day today. Aww. And my father wasn't like a, an emotional man. So him saying that was very special for me. Um, my students have heard a lot about my father, <laughs> um, you know, and it, like all these crazy stories I could tell about him. And it, you know, yes, I'm very sad that he's gone, but he's left me so many positive memories and so many positive influences that it, it's hard to cry about him being gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, cause I know she's watching. My mom <laughs> is good too. I just want to make sure that she knows that uh, she, you know, she, she calls me every week and, you know, we, we, like I said, she'll, she, she'll even ask me about TV shows she has no interest in because she knows I do, and, and I appreciate Aww. that. Aww. <laughs> well, speaking of talking to people, if you could talk to anyone, alive or dead, who would you, who would you talk to and what would you ask this person? It'd probably be my father. And I'd probably tell him about you know, all the stuff that I've been doing since he, he passed. And I'm sure he would be very proud of me. I, I, I would like to think so. I think he'd be like, you know, that's my boy. <laughs> Although he wasn't impressed with my apartment when he saw it. Because <laughs> he was used to the nice big apartment I had in New York. And then he sees my little place here. He's like, that's it? Really? <laughs> and um, I can imagine him looking at all these Lego sets and going, where do you sleep? I don't get it. <laughs> because I, the next day I took him to the museum about uh, to a museum that showed um, how Ch Czechoslovaks lived. And he's looking at the TV room of this apartment. He said, this one room's bigger than your place. <laughs> like, he just wouldn't let it go that this place was small. <laughs> and, you know, that, that was him. That, that was him, you know, and uh, that's, that's why, you know, I, I would want to talk to him again. He sounds like a riot. <laughs> he, he was he was and of course he thought he was the uh the funniest guy in the world um like he he was very happy i was home between new york and prague because he had someone to mow the lawn mm. and he wouldn't just ask me to mow the lawn he'd be like brad dad lawn's looking a little long uh-huh <laughs> someone should fix it uh-huh someone sitting here with, on my money uh huh. Someone who should, you know, do some work because he's going. Dad, ask me to mow the lawn. Mow the lawn <laughs> tomorrow if it doesn't rain. And he always thought he was so clever and funny doing that. But yeah, he, you know, looking back, he, that that was him. And, and you know, he, he's left so many positive memories. And oh, that's great. Um, um, in fact, a recent episode of Star Trek made me sad because I remembered all the times we watched Star Trek together and we'd always end our calls with live long and prosper. So, oh. you know, that brought back a lot of positive memories too. And um, yeah, so it'd be him. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the best piece of advice that you can give your students? There are actually two. Uh, the first would be the one that I'd already said uh, earlier, don't expect to be Oscar Wilde after just a few lessons because the important thing is being understood you know right. very rarely is anybody going to care that you dropped an article or you mispronounce a word if you communicate to them that you want a cheeseburger or you're looking for the train station you did it the other thing i would say is that think of this as a marathon not a sprint it is a lifetime goal that you are learning a language so there will be things that will always be difficult. There will always be things you don't quite get. Um, it's also the attitude I'm taking with Czech because 
because uh, there are there are sounds in this language that exist in no other language on this planet. <laughs> and it, it has become a joke with my students um, that like I'm like, you know, you could have made my life a lot easier if you kept with German. But no, František Polotsky had to have the Czech National Revival. He had to be like, we have to save We have to save the cases. Thanks, František. Uh, so I tell them, that's what I tell them, is that you're in a marathon, not a sprint. And if you can make yourself understood, that's all that matters. Because you're going to be speaking to people who are running tourist places. You're going to be speaking to other ESL people. The chance that someone's going to go there and be like, oh, you didn't say the the is, is very low. So don't sweat it. Just learn and just keep going. Good. That's pretty good piece of advice. I try. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, again, uh, we're going to be posting all of your information in the description box below and sure. on my website. So you can, uh, if anyone is trying to get a hold of you or maybe want lessons with you, they can do that. Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I, I assume you have, you know, the, the information there on your website. Yes. Yes, you can you can contact me uh, through the website. Email would be preferred. Okay, so lots of ways to get in touch with you. <laughs> All right. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming here today and talking with us. And yes, uh, and it's it's been fun as always. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. And uh, I should point out, I mentioned going independent. It was Ellie that was a big part of that. She. <laughs> Uh, gave me a lot of great advice. And um, I should say that uh, I also learned from her in that regard. So I know that she herself is a good teacher. So thank you for that, Ellie. Oh, thank you so much. Did you want to say goodbye to your mom if she's still there? <laughs> <laughs> bye, mom. Here you on Saturday. <laughs> and bye to anybody else watching that knows me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for today, my students. Thank you so much for stopping by and watching. And we'll be doing another one of these in two weeks. So make sure that you like and subscribe and share, you know, and all that other fun stuff. And I'll be posting more videos on the channel as well. So thanks again, Brad. And thank you, my students. You're welcome. And as always, please keep practicing, my students. Bye. Bye.